Lafayette, we are here. The French history podcast for the American public by a Frenchman. Learn all about France's fascinating history. It's great characters like Charlemagne, Joan of Arc, Louis XIV, or Napoleon. But also the great events that marked France, Europe, and sometimes the whole world. Lafayette, we are here. Available wherever you get your podcast or on lafayettepodcast.com. A bientôt. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 7, The Burgundian Bachelor. We ended our last episode with the death of John the Good, or not so good if you were living in France in the mid-1300s, and his son's rise to power in the kingdom. In 1363, Philip the Bold, at the age of just 21, was the preeminent noble in France. Conferred first by his father and then confirmed by his brother, the newly minted King Charles V, Philip was the Duke of the wealthy and powerful Duchy of Burgundy and held as a royal lieutenant authority over the wider region. Not only that, but he had also managed to secure for himself the inheritance of the county of Burgundy upon the death of a not-so-distant cousin. While Philip was the youngest of his brothers, his keen and ruthless political skills and his personal connections set him up to have the greatest trajectory of all of them. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Due to the later Dukes of Burgundy's conflict with and eventual break with France, it is easy to read an independent streak into some of the actions that Philip took while Duke. However, it is important to remember that Philip saw himself first and foremost as a French prince. Throughout his life, he was the son, brother, and uncle to three successive French kings, and the city that he spent most of his life in was not Dijon, or Besançon, or Ghent, or Bruges, but Paris. Later in his life, he would sign his documents as Philip, son of the King of France, Duke of Burgundy, Count of Flanders, of Artois, and of the Burgundian Palatinate, Lord of Ceylon, Count of Rethel, and Lord of Mechelen. By the time that he gained all of these other territories, his father was long dead, but his status as son of the king was still his most prized title. Philip might have had ambitions that took him out of France and into the Holy Roman Empire and elsewhere, but at the end of the day, his primary interests were still in the kingdom. He had a close working relationship with his brother, King Charles V, and utterly dominated his nephew, Charles VI. Sure, he always looked out for number one, but that was all in the context of a French prince using the tools that were at the disposal of a French prince, not one of an independent-minded lord looking to carve out a kingdom. And so, as a member of the royal family, Philip was expected to find a worthy match. Philip's father, John, wanted to increase French influence in Italy, and so, when he was alive, tried to arrange a marriage between Philip and the widowed Queen of Naples. But wanting to keep her independence, she decided to marry someone less connected to the high courts of Europe. After John's death, Charles and Philip began to collude in order to find a match. Many polities throughout Christendom were brought up and either dismissed or plans fell through. But at the end of the day, one bachelorette stood above the rest, Margaret, the daughter of Louis of Mala and widow of Philip of Rouve. So before we get to the Lady of the Hour, let's look at her father's history in Flanders. We've been dancing around Louis of Mala for a while. Last episode, we mentioned him as an example of accumulating inheritances, and before that, we covered his father, Louis of Nevers, in some detail. So let's pick up with Flanders and Louis of Mala after the death of his father in the Battle of Crecy. After the death of his father, Louis made his way back to Flanders. When we last left the county, it was under the semi-dictatorial control of Jacob van Artevelde. However, in 1345, the year before Crecy, van Artevelde was undone. In my previous episode on Flanders, I covered a lot, and so there wasn't enough time to give the brewer of Ghent, Jacob van Artevelde, the coverage that his story deserves. While I won't delve too deep into the weeds, I do plan on covering it more right now. I mentioned back in episode 4 how Flanders was rocked by conflict throughout the years leading up to the Hundred Years' War. The towns were growing wealthier and more self-assured, 
And not only was there conflict between the towns and the feudal nobility, but there was conflict between the towns themselves and between the classes within each town. The power of the burghers was beginning to be supplanted by the power of guild leaders, with their economic heft and influence over the masses. While we don't know if Jakob von Artevelde was a leader of the guild, and there's good reason to suspect he wasn't, even though his sobriquet implied a connection to the Brewers' Guild, his major power base was the guilds and their organization. And so growing resentment towards Louis of Nevers and his collection of Flanders' war indemnity was combined with the threat of economic ruin that an English blockade represented, and the towns of Flanders were driven into open rebellion. The rebellion of von Artevelde changed the whole dynamic of how the towns and the rest of Flanders interacted. As mentioned previously, this rebellion saw the creation of the three members of Flanders, a governing body composed of Ghent, Bruges, and Yper. Jakob von Artevelde also divided the county into quarters, that's with a capital Q by the way, there were really just three of them, where each of the three members would hold sway over the lands and smaller cities around them. It's also important to note that the town's resentment of the nobility was mirrored in the peasants' resentment of the towns. Now, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but over the years, as the towns were flexing their might, much of that flexing was done at the expense of the peasantry. If word got out that some peasants wanted to homestead and create their own products to avoid paying the high prices instituted by the guilds, a town militia could be expected to make short work of their nascent operation. So while von Artevelde held dictatorial power over Ghent, Bruges, and Yper through the institution of the three members, as he traveled away from the major city centers, his power base fell off. After his meteoric rise, and as he began to alienate many who had been dissatisfied with Louis of Nevers, but were not ready to wholly abandon him, von Artevelde's power slowly began to shrink back towards the cities. One of the centers of resistance to the Artevelde regime was the rural part of Bruges' quarter, known as the Franc of Bruges. The Franc was largely controlled by the rural nobility of Flanders, and where their influence was the strongest. So, as Artevelde's regime grew more unpopular, the importance of the Franc rose in response. However, resistance to Jakob von Artevelde was not confined to the countryside. In the cities, the patriciate were also beginning to chafe under his support of the guilds. After forcing their way into the town councils and magistracies in the wake of the Battle of the Golden Spurs, the guilds were never fully forced out. They weren't in complete control, but they still had a great deal of influence over policy. Generally in this period, town governments of Flanders were split between the patriciate, the weavers, and the smaller guilds. Under von Artevelde, the guilds and especially the weavers had much more control over the major cities of Flanders, and this, of course, was at the expense of his supporters among the burghers. While the patriciate still had a seat at the table, day by day, the guildsmen were starting to crowd them out. So Jakob von Artevelde was not only alienating burghers, peasants, and nobles, he was also on his way to alienating the urban masses. Again, in medieval Flemish history, the most important thing to note is that every group has issues with every other group, and that was true of the Weaver's Guild and the Fuller's Guild, both important parts of the all-important Flemish cloth industry. Their running conflict, sometimes escalating into full-scale urban war, and Jakob van Artevelde's inability to deal with it caused many neutral parties to grow dissatisfied with him and that dissatisfaction was added to by both the Weavers and the Fullers, as von Artevelde bounced between the two parties, supporting whichever one seemed like the best option for him at the time. And to make matters worse, Artois was cutting off the grain supply. About half of the imported grain in Flanders came from France, and the other half came from other low country polities in the empire. The imperial counties also sided with England, but Artois in France was doing nothing of the sort. While the French couldn't pressure the Flemish through their wallets, they could still do so through their stomachs. As the brewer of Ghent was losing his supporters, he was cozying up more and more with England. Remember, despite being called the brewer of Ghent, Jakob von Artevelde made his fortune as a cloth merchant, and he always made sure that English wool was flowing into Flanders. However, despite the commercial connection to England and the rocky history with the rulers of France, Many Flemings were not so eager to turn their backs on the oaths that they had taken as subjects of the French king. Von Artevelde's recognition of Edward III as King of France had helped with their discomfort to a degree, but many still saw it as illegitimate. 
So when rumors began to swirl that von Artevelde was scheming to proclaim the Black Prince the new Count of Flanders, the people had had enough. When Jakob von Artevelde returned to Ghent after a long negotiation with England, he was attacked and killed by an angry mob. I feel like I should note that the people of Ghent were not motivated by the same pre-images of French patriotism that the lords of Burgundy were when they shunned Charles the Bad. Their reaction was more tied into personal honor. Their honor may have been bruised when they turned their backs on their oaths to the Valois kings, but that was papered over with legalism and technicality. A possible elevation of the Black Prince to Count would have had none of that. While the people of the cities of Flanders may have not been part of the feudal hierarchy, they were no less crazed about honor. I feel like it's hard to overstate just how much all of this mattered. Their honor and their oaths to the lords were tied to the church, and in the wake of the revolt, many felt that their souls were on the line. While the Flemings may have wanted nothing to do with the French kings, and may have openly opposed their counts on a number of occasions, to simply turn their backs on their oaths of loyalty for geopolitical reasons was a step too far. That being said, it's not as if these things didn't happen all the time in the medieval world. It's more that sometimes it mattered and sometimes it didn't. Here, it mattered. And so, this step too far, compounded with already simmering discontent and the open hostility of the countryside, and von Artevelde was brought down. After the fall of Jakob von Artevelde, the guildsmen and burghers of Flanders were somewhat more hesitant to ally so close to England, but they were still unwilling to take back their French count. Therefore, after Cressy, the new count, Louis of Malle, was able to walk a middle path between the French and English, balancing the positions of his father and his great-grandfather. Louis did quite a good job here. His overarching goal as count was to prevent another person in the mold of Jakob van Artevelde from toppling him like his father was. And while later in life he was not entirely successful, more on that in a future episode, his early years saw him playing every interested party in Flanders off each other. For example, Louis ended up keeping the three members of Flanders around, although not before stripping of, of much of its official power, seeing it not as the vehicle that led to his father's exile, but as a useful tool to maintain influence and dialogue with the cities. Louis took special care to maintain his relationship with the cities. He staged a joyous entry into the major cities of Flanders, a ceremony where a new ruler enters a city and swears to uphold the rights and privileges of that city. The joyous entry is an extremely important part of the relationship between the counts and the cities of Flanders, and along with the counts' oaths, the citizens of the city swear oaths of loyalty back. It was these oaths that the Gentinars were unwilling to break, leading to von Artevelde's fall. The joyous entry dates back to 1127, and as the Dukes of Burgundy gain more power in the Low Countries, joyous entries will begin to take on more importance. Louis, time and time again, showed himself to be a practical man. He was not blind to the changes that had occurred over the past few decades, and rather than trying to return everything to how it was in the 1200s, he accepted that changes had to be made to the political system. He diminished the political power of the guilds in the cities, sure, but he did not attempt to snuff it out. While von Artevelde attempted to play each party off each other and ended up alienating all of them, Louis did so more successfully. He may not have earned many great friends in the county, but he also did not create any great enemies. This is not to say that revolts did not pop up. In fact, the first decade of his reign in Flanders saw city rebellions flaring up with some regularity. Louis's skillful politicking did, however, mean that none of these revolts ever turned into a major catastrophe, at least until 1379. And speaking of playing parties off each other, there were two very powerful opposing parties that had great interest in Flanders, France and England. As I mentioned above, Louis of Malle spent much of his early years as count balancing the interests of England and France. In the first years of his reign, he arranged a peace between England and Flanders in order to keep the wool flowing. However, facing pressure to marry into the English royal family from both the English and his towns, he instead chose to marry a daughter of the Duke of neighboring Brabant, who at the time was allied with the French. This marriage caused some unrest among the towns who feared that their new count was going to throw away the recent peace. There was a short-lived revolt and Louis ended up having to flee to Brabant. But, in the end, it wasn't a serious threat to his office, and once it was put down, he was able to increase his power over the cities and reduce the power of the more radical guilds in the peace settlement. 
Louis then, to maintain the support of the towns, refused to pay homage to John the Good when Philip VI died. Luckily for Louis, at the moment John had other things to deal with, and so Louis of Mala continued to give a little to each side whenever their faith in him was beginning to waver. Upon the death of his father-in-law, the Duke of Brabant, Louis attempted to press the claim of his wife to take control of the duchy, which was almost as rich as Flanders was. His attempts ultimately failed due to his sister-in-law calling upon another brother-in-law, the Holy Roman Emperor, for aid, but the expedition was not fruitless, as he was able to peel some territory, including the wealthy cities of Antwerp and Mechelen, away from Brabant. He also managed to arrange his daughter's succession to Brabant if the Duchess died childless. While this action was supported by the cities of Flanders, it was an expensive expedition, and the cities of Flanders were less enthusiastic to foot the bill for it. During this war, you might recall that Paris was in revolt under the proto-revolutionary Etienne Marcel, and the people were chanting, Ghent, Ghent, in the streets. Louis may have been somewhat shaken by the implications of this cry, alongside a subtle but noticeable increase in urban grumbling. So this period marks a relaxation of some of his actions taken to limit city independence in the wake of his earlier trip to Brabant. Hinting at pursuing closer ties with France over England, we next see Louis marrying his daughter Margaret to Philip, the young Duke of Burgundy. No, the other Philip, Philip of Rouve. The match between Margaret and Philip was a promising one, but Philip of Rouve died before it was ever consummated. His lands were divvied up, and Margaret again became one of the most eligible bachelorettes in Europe. So now that we've spent half the episode catching up with Flanders, what's next? Louis continued with his strategy of staking out a middle position between France and England. The kings of both each had their own pet candidate for her hand. Edward III wanted her to marry one of his sons, and Charles V wanted her to marry his brother, Philip the Bold. We know who won out in the end, but I would be remiss if I didn't pass along the following story. Initially, Louis seems to have not seriously considered marrying Margaret to the son of the English king, but rather wanted to leverage the offer to secure a better deal with France. However, that seemed to change when Edward offered succession to Calais and the counties of Ponthieu and Guine, and to pass over his claim to Haino, Holland. This advantage did not last long, as under pressure from the King of France, the Pope, currently residing in Avignon, decreed that the match could not be made due to consanguinity. It was now the French king's turn to make his offer. He obtained a papal dispensation for Philip to marry any relatives within the third or fourth degree of consanguinity, and threw in the return of Gallican Flanders, which Philip IV had taken fifty years earlier, and a large bride price. However, it seemed that Louis was unwilling to consent to this match. He valued the independence that Flanders had, and worried that Flanders would simply be absorbed into France upon his death if the match went through. If he heard how Charles V referred to the marriage as completing the work of Philip IV, those fears would have been justified. However, his mother Margaret, the Countess of Burgundy and Artois, and a Capetian princess in her own right, was firmly in favor of the match and ended up convincing her son to go through with it. It is said that during an argument about the potential marriage, she grabbed one of her breasts in one hand and a knife in the other, and as the Baron de Barant, a great romantic historian of Burgundy put it, said, quote, since you refuse to obey the wishes of your king and your mother, I intend, in order to shame you, to cut off this breast which fed you, you and no one else, and to throw it to the dogs. This dramatic turn was reported to have pushed Louis into accepting the Burgundian bachelor, but I should note that she also threatened to disinherit him from Artois, which might have made more of an impact, depending on how much Louis of Mala valued the county. And so the match was made. Charles and Philip made a secret deal to return Gallican Flanders to the crown upon the death of Louis of Mala, but Philip, again always looking primarily after his own interests, would not follow through. In the end, Philip the Bold did much to preserve Flemish independence. His rule saw a formalization of many of the institutions of Flanders, and the Burgundian state he began to build in the Low Countries would outlive his dynasty. But we'll get to that later. While Philip the Bold's wedding had great implications for the county of Flanders, it had more immediate ones for another county, Burgundy. I mentioned last episode that Margaret of Burgundy had agreed to give Burgundy to Philip upon her death, and by marrying the only grandchild of Margaret, Philip had united the Valois and Capetian claims to it, 
If that wasn't enough layers of legitimacy, the Holy Roman Emperor had invested Philip with the County of Burgundy in 1362. Although that was more a destabilizing event than anything else, which threatened to undo much of the negotiations between John the Good and Margaret of Burgundy. So far, I have only mentioned the County of Burgundy in passing, and honestly, the county was never the center of the Burgundian world. Its tax revenues were smaller than those of the duchy, and significantly smaller than those of Flanders, and its lords were very independent. Under the Valois Dukes, the County of Burgundy would be fully incorporated into the Burgundian state, but it never did reach the same level of prominence that the other territories they controlled did. Still, though, I don't want to completely ignore it. The County of Burgundy, as mentioned in Episode 2, was a part of Middle Francia, and eventually made its way into Eastern Francia, and then the German Empire. For a while, its rulers were called kings, and if you recall Boso of Provence, the crown he was attempting to usurp was that of Burgundy and Provence. Confusingly enough, for a while there were actually three Burgundies. There was the Duchy in West Francia, the Kingdom of Upper Burgundy, which eventually became the County of Burgundy and much of the Swiss Confederation, and the Kingdom of Lower Burgundy, which became Provence, Savoy, and Dauphiné, and will now exit our story for the most part. The kingdoms of Upper and Lower Burgundy were formed as the Carolingian family was losing power in their empire. Lower Burgundy was formed by Boso, while a member of the Welf family founded the Kingdom of Upper Burgundy not long after, in the wake of the death of the Carolingian Emperor Charles the Fat. Now the Welfs aren't going to appear much in this podcast, but if you're interested at all in medieval German history, you're going to become quite familiar with them. What's useful for us to know is that the Welfs did manage to briefly unite Upper and Lower Burgundy, but the Burgundian branch of the family died out, and the two kingdoms of Burgundy passed to the German emperors, who henceforth also held the title King of Burgundy. More relevant for us, making up the western half of the Kingdom of Upper Burgundy was the County of Burgundy. As the years passed, the power of the kings of Burgundy waned, and more and more local magnates like the Count of Burgundy came to dominate politics. In 982, the county passed to Otto William, who, if you'll recall, fought with King Robert II of France for control of the Duchy of Burgundy. One of Otto William's descendants was able to briefly break free from imperial control. He thus became the Free Count of Burgundy, and consequently, the County of Burgundy gained its name of Franche Comte, or Free County. The name would stick, but the independence would not. The Count died without sons, and his daughter married the German Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, bringing the Franche Comte back into the imperial orbit, and combining the county and kingdom. But the county passed to a younger son after his death. The County of Burgundy, now out of the hands of the German Emperors, would eventually pass to the Capetians, and then briefly to the Capetian House of Burgundy. Upon the death of Philip of Rouve, the county passed back to the Capetians proper, but again, this would also be brief. Margaret of Burgundy was old, and it seemed that soon Burgundy would be in the hands of the Counts of Flanders. The Franche Comte did not undergo the same state-building project that the Duchy of Burgundy did. It was ruled more by feudal lords and feudal ties than by institutions, and the only city of note in it was the free imperial city of Besançon. By the time that the county passed to Margaret, the lords of the free county had long gotten used to having little oversight. When Philip the Bold had first taken control of the Duchy of Burgundy, the duchy and county were actually at war. This was in part due to the competing claims on the county, but mostly due to local rivalries. While Philip and Margaret were nominally in charge of this conflict, the local lords of both the duchy and county were really calling the shots. In fact, on a few occasions, Philip and Margaret had attempted to make peace with each other, only to have the war continue without them. Finally, the lords of the duchy were able to capture the most disagreeable lords of the county, and Philip threw them in prison. Once this was done, tensions between the two Burgundies cooled significantly, and Philip and Margaret, and more importantly, Philip and the nobles of the county, were able to make peace for real. Despite the war that had just occurred, Margaret seemed to bear no ill will towards Philip, and in fact was quite taken with him, as we saw earlier in the episode. The two only grew closer when Philip married her granddaughter, and while Philip would not gain control of the county until 1384, from this point on, his court and that of Margaret's were connected, and she seems to have involved him and his wife in the governance of the county from time to time. However, seemingly to underscore the relative unimportance of the county, Philip would only visit it a handful of times when he reigned as count, 
In Philip's defense, he was a very busy man and had responsibilities in the duchy, Flanders, and in Paris. So before we get to the all-important wedding between Philip the Bold and Margaret of Mala, let's take a look at what Philip was doing in Burgundy, other than waging war with the county, of course. In the grand scheme of things, the war with the county of Burgundy was an annoyance. The real threat to the duchy came from roving bands of free companies. The free companies were bands of mercenary that now had no work due to the Treaty of Brittany. They therefore turned from warfighting to banditry. Burgundy had been without a strong central authority since the death of Duke Odo IV. Philip of Rouve, Joan of Burgundy, and King John were all either too weak or too occupied elsewhere to really deal with the problems facing Burgundy, and so it was up to the institutions of Burgundy to deal with the marauding mercenaries. The decade leading up to Philip's investment was not easy for Burgundy. Apart from being menaced by the Comtois nobles and the free companies, the English had launched a chevouche into Burgundy in 1360, and the duchy was hit quite hard by the plague. Unfortunately for Burgundy, Philip was at first more interested in the affairs of France than the affairs of his new duchy. He was determined to live the high life, and really only corresponded with the duchy when he needed some tax revenue. However, this youthful incompetence would not stay with him for long. Soon enough he realized his responsibilities, and even if he remained mostly in Paris, would make frequent trips to his duchy and keep in contact with his institutions so he could, you know, actually rule it. Like I mentioned earlier, in Philip's first years, the free companies were out of control. Sometimes they would act as mercenaries for the English or for Charles the Bad, and sometimes they just decided to create chaos and devastation for its own sake. Apart from raiding and pillaging, the bands would sometimes take over a town or castle for a spell, and the occasional plot was even hatched to kidnap or kill the young duke. In general, even defeating them in battle was pointless, as it seemed like as soon as one company was disbanded, another would pop up in its place. The hot phases of the Hundred Years' War saw thousands of mercenaries drawn to France, and its cold, well, coolish more than cold, phases saw them remain there and cause devastation. The first six years of Philip's rule saw the worst of it. Commerce ground to a halt because the roads of Burgundy were so dangerous. Towns and fortresses were seized by the companies and the duchy was essentially lawless. Philip managed to at least get a handle on things by instituting a major duchy-wide project of wall building and reconstruction. In the end, the best strategy to deal with them was to simply hire them or distract them. Philip made use of many companies during his war with the county and with other conflicts that he occasionally found himself in. The pressure only truly got released when the Hundred Years' War grew hot again and the free companies found work in the major conflicts of its new phase. However, they would not leave Burgundy for good and the next two decades still saw more than a few raids by them. As the years passed, Philip began to grow more settled into his role and he started to expand his power and influence. In 1366, he managed to get his lieutenant generalcy expanded to encompass all of Champagne and gain control over the wealthy region. In 1368, another conflict between the lower nobility broke out, this time between Burgundy and the neighboring imperial county of Savoy. Philip was able to neatly settle this conflict before it spiraled out of control and was able to sign a treaty of friendship with its count, showing some of the first glimpses of his genius at diplomacy. Philip the Bold was also a regular guest at Avignon, and was well connected to the papacy. In fact, when the Pope attempted to return to Rome, it was Philip who convinced him to stay under the protection of the kings of France, at least until a new and more independent-minded Pope came to the papal throne. He was also sure to be well integrated into the French court. Philip managed to get many of his own men in high positions in the government, and also paid many other court officials a salary in exchange for them pledging homage to him. While today we might call this practice blatant corruption, at the time it was known as fief rent and was not a controversial act in the feudal framework. Philip was well on his way to establishing his power both within and outside of France, and the crowning achievement of his early career was his marriage to Margaret of Mala. In 1369, Louis of Mala, with much encouragement from both the king and his mother, finally agreed to betroth his daughter to Philip. The two were married in Ghent later that year. Philip then made his first tour of Flanders, and it must have been quite a journey. Burgundy was a wealthy duchy, sure, but it had been ravaged by plague, violence, and poor harvests in recent years. And even without all that, at its peak, it did not hold a candle to the commercial activity of Flanders. 
which although also was hit hard by war, disease, and revolt, was still going strong. Burgundy's economy was almost entirely focused around rural production. Its most famous export was of course wine, and so essentially all of the wealth of the duchy came from land ownership and agriculture. Dijon was by far the largest city in the duchy, and its population was still only about a sixth of Ghent's. Flanders was a dynamic, urban, and commercialized society at the cutting edge of political and economic development in Europe. Philip would have to learn how to properly govern the county and how its governance differed from Burgundy's if he did not want to have to deal with revolt after revolt. At his wedding feast, Philip made sure to leave good impressions on all the parties of Flanders. He lavished the local lords with gifts and was sure to honor the patricians of the major cities. He sat down with the rulers of Brabant and Hanno Holland Zealand and forged working relationships with them. He made sure to let the clergy of Flanders know that he was a friend and a link to the far-off Avignon papacy. Philip's future in Flanders was bright, and he was glad-handing like the best politician. But we'll have to wait to see Philip's first years in Flanders. Next time, we'll cover Philip's role in the Hundred Years' War, his first steps onto the world stage as a diplomat, and the lessons he would learn while preparing to become Count of Flanders. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me on twitter.com slash valoisburgundy or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website at granddukesofthewest.com.